Our guest today has spent a huge portion of her life being involved with many organizations aimed at bettering the lives of animals as well as the humans around them. These include the Director of Volunteer Programs for Los Angeles Animal Services, Founder and Executive Director of Kids and Pets, and the Director of Pals to Pets. Her passion for raising awareness through education and public speaking continues to reach out nationwide. Currently, our guest is the Public Information Director for programs including VIP, Volunteer Information Professionals, and the world-famous PUP program at Los Angeles World Airport, LAX. Our guest developed and created the Pets Unstressing program in 2012 with the purpose of alleviating stress and anxiety at airports. She has assisted 90 airports to date, both nationally and internationally. You guys, we are honored to welcome Heidi Hubner to a podcast. Thank you so much Welcome. for being here. Thank you for having me. Hi, everybody. Yay. <laughs> You've been in so many different parts of the animal welfare world. How has that transition felt for you? Like you went started really corporate, right, at LA Animal Services. Right. Well, I have to say, since I was a kid, I think out of the womb, it was all about animals, <laughs> like rescuing them from the street, you know, bringing home whatever I could find. And... Finding myself at animal services, I never thought that's a place I would work. Yeah. That's right? Tough. Tell us about that. Um, I got hired to be their volunteer director to revamp their volunteer program. And they had not had a person in that position in years. So I got it. I embraced it. It was a love hate relationship because yeah. you're dealing with so many different personalities. You know, the volunteers, their hearts, their souls living and breathing to save these animals. And then you're dealing with management and rules and regulations of the city. And it was, you guys, we all have to figure this out together. This is not going to work. And we did great things for yeah. several years. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's so interesting to go over your list of accolades and see that so many of your focuses have been the relationship between animals and humans. Like humans play a role in each of the things that you've done. I think that's so cool. Absolutely, because you can't have one without the other. You know, we're the ones who domesticated pets and especially dogs. So we have to be there for them and take care of them. So we have to have empathy for people who have maybe made bad choices and how do we help them to keep their animal in their home? Or how do we say, hey, maybe this is not the right time to have an animal. Maybe you can volunteer or you can donate or foster. Mm -hmm. Educating. You know, if we don't educate people, nothing is ever going to change. How many years were you with LA Animal Services? Four years. How did your brain chemistry change over those four years that you were there? This is a funny story. My very first day of work was they wanted me to go to a commission meeting. I'm like, okay, I did not know what a commission meeting was. I didn't even know where my desk was or my office was. So here I, and my one friend, um, God rest her soul, Lori Golden from the Pet Press, she's like, but Heidi, you have to dress cute. You can't wear what you would wear working with dogs. And I was like, oh, thank you for that. So <laughs> I was just gonna show up how I would, you know. You have to look cute. And so I was like, oh, okay, here's a skirt and a shirt and put that on and went there and everybody's yelling and screaming, what are you going to do and what's your plan and da, 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 da. And I was like, hold on, I don't even know where my office is. Like, I literally I don't know where. here. <laughs> I don't know anything. So stay tuned. <laughs> Let me figure out where my office is. Let me meet with all the volunteers and the staff at the different shelters. And then I'm going to tell you what my plan is. And it was like, oh, oh, Okay. I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. That kind of set the tone of what I was going to be up against. Yeah, just like put a pin in it. Right. Let's start at square one. So you started out rogue. Right. <laughs> and it sounds like they let you be a little bit rogue for a little while. Right. And how did it morph? It, so th my plan like I said, was I have to meet with the volunteers. So I met with the volunteers at each shelter. 
And, and which shelters are we speaking? Just to, I want that to be our listeners to know. So those are the six city animal shelters, LA Animal Services. Um, and they're spread out throughout the city. And for mm-hmm. those of you who live in Los Angeles, you know how big <laughs> this right. place is. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, that, that was the first plan of action to meet with the volunteers and, and then separately the shelter staff and just have them be open and honest. Mm-hmm. What's working, what's not working. If I had a magic wand, what does that look like? And, you know, in doing so, so many people wanted the same thing. They just didn't know how to talk about it because there was so much angst and anxiety and yeah. anger built up. So everybody just stopped talking and like, they're the bad person and, you know, they're not good and blah, 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 blah. So then I said, well, we don't have people at the shelter, like on the staff side, there has to be like a point person. You can't just come in and, you know, so today Lindsay's working and then, you know, the next day Ellen's working and, you know, you had talked to the volunteers about one thing and you come in and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I created volunteer uh, liaison coordinators and Um, with staff who wanted to do it. Wow. And so then each shelter had a point person for the volunteers to go to. So this way, everybody knew Lindsay was on the same page. Ellen's on the same page. Heidi's on the same page. And then we all would work together and have meetings together and then come up with, you know, what's working, what's not working. You know, not every shelter has the same problems. Totally. So it was it turned out to be really good and really Mm -hmm. positive. Is that still in effect now? Um, It is in a different way. They have been without a volunteer director, but I heard they actually have somebody who they're going to put in place who's amazing. And I'm really happy about that. And then just the other thing, too, um, the building, again, the trust between both groups was Mm. really, really important and having open communication. And it was like, you don't have to go through me. Talk to your people at your shelter. You know, come to me if you have a problem. Right. And then the other thing, the volunteers wanted to do events. And I get it, doing mobile adoption events, the dogs are out of the shelter, the cats are out of the shelters, the bunnies are feeling like, you know, oh, I'm in fresh air and I'm on a leash and I'm getting walked. And they were getting adopted quicker. They only did like one or two a year. So, ladies, I came in and we did 120 120? Events my first year. I was like, we are out there and we are doing it. There are only 52 weeks in a year. <laughs> you were very busy. We were all over the place. I'm serious. And did you see a significant increase in adoption because of that outreach? Huge. That's so cool. And was this timing wise years wise when was this was social media around we did not have social media this was in wow. 2004 okay you know not i don't even, even facebook no we were not using it i mean we oh, had wow. a, a website <laughs> and we weren't even really utilizing that wow so this is a real scene equals saved issue like you had all of these wonderful dogs but unless you were going to the shelter you were not seeing these dogs and without seeing the dogs the dogs cannot be saved so correct in a time where there are not cell phones or social media or these huge ways to blast out this information about dogs. How did you do it? How'd you manage that? We used to have flyers that we would make copies and the volunteers and the shelter staff would like post them in the areas that we were going to be in for the events. Um, going out. Then we also did a lot of in-house shelter events, which they had never done before. So we partnered with a group called Rescue Humane Alliance, and we did like Valentine's, Halloween, getting people into the shelter with discounted rates, Oh, you know, and creating like the senior for senior program and just like, let's just be creative to get these animals out. So I'm, I'm kind of all over the place. I want to go back to. So again, it was flyers, word of mouth. Um, we would go to local news stations and like, can we bring a dog in and just talk about what's happening? And, you know, people can come visit us. We would print out, like make copies of the the black and white pictures with the information of the animals who would be at the events. I mean, it was just so crazy, like archaic when we look yeah. at what we do now. Yeah, and then the wow. paperwork that the clerks would have to do for the adoptees to fill out. I don't know. I honestly, now I look back and I don't know how we did it. Oh yeah. We really take that for granted. Yeah. I mean, it still takes time to check out at the animal shelter, but like at least it's on a computer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I know what you're talking about because when I first got involved, it was through our mutual friend, Renelle. And at the time she was running Animal Advocates Alliance. 
And this was right around the time that I got on Facebook. And it, that was that turned out to be everything for these dogs because I just remember like prior to that, they would animal advocates would have to send out email blasts about every single dog. Oh yeah. Um, there were flyers. There were they did a lot of adoption events, and that's kind of how I got my start just by holding a leash of an adoptable dog. But yeah, and then all of a sudden Facebook came to be, and all of these dogs, shelter dogs kept popping up on my feed because it loads in all your contacts and all those contacts were now rescue people and you know all of a sudden there it was starting to happen yep. for these dogs a little bit being That's able amazing. to move them a little bit faster yeah but okay. I can't imagine what life was like for yeah, you yeah that was an extra that. challenge for yeah. sure and it went and just the you know phone calls Could we we did we were not texting then or at least i wasn't like we i don't think our phones that had the capability to do that maybe they had t9 when you had to like press the buttons <laughs> do you know what i'm talking oh, about yes like three times to get the third letter yeah i remember it that. took a lot longer to so get i probably was like i'm not gonna do that it it's doesn't just yeah maybe you didn't have it yeah. <laughs> there certainly was no voice text we'll just put it that way yeah <laughs> but when like we would do events at different like we did paramount with um studios they had their like day of giving back and they were like, hey, let's have animals here. I'm like, yes, we'll be there. So there was so much planning that took yeah. so long because it was like, hey, calling you back. Just want to make sure we're still on. Right. Did you check your email? Where now it's just like instant. Totally. So what was the pivotal moment where you were like, OK, I think I can't do this anymore. I think I'm done here. I think I need to go on to my next thing. Um, there was just a lot happening at that time, a lot of ugly stuff. And I was like, wow, I'm already in it. Compassion fatigue, you know, sometimes just feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall. They had general managers coming and going. Um, and obviously I was supposed to leave there to segue into what I'm doing now. So I think it was just kind of like, wow, I got real sick, like really sick with Epstein's bar. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, just complete, not even realizing, completely worn out for like six months. And oh. I was like, mm, I need to figure out. Yeah. I got to, what am I going to do? What does compassion fatigue, because we use that word a lot. Yeah, well, we deal with it a lot. We What's deal with it, it a look lot like too. for you? Yeah, what did that look like for you as a, a working at LA Animal Services? I can only imagine. Because it was literally 24-7. Yeah. It was, you know, you would do an adoption event and adopt out like 50 dogs and 30 cats. And then literally, I remember this one particular one at East Valley we were doing. And this lady came in with 20 adult cats and she's like take them and I was like oh my god wait what 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 just like the revolving door the, thank you and that's what I said it's a freaking revolving door yeah and so I said this is what the media needs to see mm -hmm. they need to understand yay for us look at all these great numbers but we're not even going to close the day out and so now we've only really adopted out 10 cats right right and right. like 15 dogs because here's a litter of our puppies and you know whatever it was Wow. You know, or, you know, 15 birds coming in that were seized. And management at that time only wanted to show the happy stuff. And I'm like, well, this is reality. Right. So then people think, oh, they're fine. They don't need our help. The shelters exactly. are doing great. And I'm like, exactly. yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> exactly. Was the pet overpopulation as awful then as it is now? It was. And then I thought, well, we're doing really good. And I don't know what happened, but I feel we are right back to where have we made any strides? I mean, it, I have only been in animal rescue now for six years, and there has been a significant change in that six years. So I am so curious about what it was like before I got into it. But like right now, it feels like catching your breath is impossible. And that's what it was then. And the euthanasia rate, it I mean, they were just due to, and I, I'm not knocking, I'm not knocking the shelters because no, they know. are in a hard right. place. Yes. You cannot have eight dogs in a kennel because they will start killing each other. Of course. And so how do you decide? Mm -hmm. 
that I, that could not be my job. So for those people having to make that decision, yeah, it's unbearable. Truly. But we all feel it. And the volunteers are like, where's my favorite dog? Where's that amazing cat? And it's like, right. you know, and we tried reaching out to rescue. We tried as hard as we could. And time and space, sickness, you know, disease breaks out. Oh, it's yeah. just, it, ugh, it's just never ending. Totally. And we rely so heavily on the relationship that volunteers have with the animals mm -hmm. to learn about yeah. them, to get eyes on dogs who we hadn't seen before. So I imagine you really have to let yourself create these relationships with these animals to help get them out. And then we don't know if it yeah. happens. We don't know what we would do without you guys, without those volunteers. I and mean, the programs that you built. Thank you. Oh. That's yeah. a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So you knew it was time to move on. I knew it Your was time Your body to... was telling you. Where did you go from there? I didn't know. I wanted to still work with animals, but I was, I didn't know. I'm like, how, what does this look like? I didn't want to leave California to take a job someplace else. I didn't want to work at another shelter. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then, you know, there were different rescue groups and it was like, you know, as a director how does that look and it just wasn't happening and so I um, got hired to work at LAX and I was like would I ever thought I would work at that airport no 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 absolutely no. not I wouldn't even drive to that airport if you asked me to. <laughs> and then it's like, well, what job do you have at the airport? Like, have you ever, you know, you just think, oh, it's the airlines. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a whole city of 40,000 people to make that airport run. Wait, I'm so glad you said this because I think about where do the people who work at the airport park? In regular airport parking? It depends on what your assignment is. There's off-site parking. Oh. Because the airport itself is there are not that many offices there the offices are off campus oh okay they're off campus okay i mean i realized that was off topic but just something that no that it's interesting who is, <laughs> like, well you think about that like, and it's like i mean listen none of us know unless I'm you like, work where at does starbucks get all of their pastries like how do they just drop them in on the airfield they drive it's <laughs> it's I'm just, it's a city in it wow wow okay so i'll what, take you what? a tour one day i love that you know all this stuff inside scoop yeah what was your job title at LAX at that time? Okay, so I when I came in, and because I worked for the, so I was a city employee, civil service at Animal Services. Okay. So they were trying to help me after I got sick, because it wasn't my fault, to try to put me in another position. And so when it came up at the airport, um, it was doing contracts for construction and maintenance very animal oriented yeah right <laughs> and i'm like i have no background in that at all but sure if they want to hire me great which was the best introduction to the airport because i understood how everything worked who's responsible for what how things get fixed when you hear things happening i know exactly who does what yeah so i've got allies at the airport yeah fast forward to what I do now so I was like this is not what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life great this is a stepping stone God right. universe whatever you have next I'm waiting mm -hmm. show me show me the way right so I did that for about a year and um, there are volunteers who work at the information booth at the airport I never noticed them ever I can't say I have because when we live here we know where we're going we get our stuff and we go sure but right. when you're traveling you know yeah so they had a contract that was in charge of those volunteers my friend who worked there we went to lunch one day and we were talking and I said you know I really need to leave I got to figure out what I'm doing I'm not happy and she goes well as a matter of fact um, they're going to be looking for an in-house person to take over the VIP program, the volunteer program. And I was like, what? What? What do you mean? So she told me about it. I interviewed for the job. And I'm like, well, of course this is my job. I right. work with volunteers. I love volunteers. So they moved me into that position. Amazing group of volunteers. So now I'm really learning. Oh, my God. Like, people get lost at this airport. They don't know where to go. It's confusing. I'm like, we need a therapy dog program at LAX. Totally. 
Totally. And that's why <laughs> I was supposed to work there. Yes. Wow. To create the PUP program. Wow. So, I mean, what were the steps to make that happen? So I told this to my friend and she goes, oh, Heidi, you're so funny. That will never happen. Silly Heidi. <laughs> Silly Heidi. <laughs> um, so in 2010 is when I took over the VIP program. 2011 is when the idea came up. 2012 is when I said, I'm going to put pen to paper. What do I need to do? Because then as we started talking about it more, I said, you don't understand. This is going to put LAX on the map and this is needed. And I brought my dog, Chowsey, not this one. And I said, let me show you what he does. Because he did pet therapy when I worked for Kids and Pets and Pals to Pet, my little mm-hmm. nonprofits in between. Um, and she was like, this is magic. And I said, OK. So I had to meet with city attorney, risk management, oh, executive yeah. director, and just show here's what it entails. Took my dog. This is what they do. And um, their biggest concern was what if something happens? We don't want the airport to get sued. Right. So like risk management. Mm-hmm. So Alliance of Therapy Dogs is a group. There are uh, a handful of groups that register, certify, and insure the volunteers, their dogs, and then put the facility on their insurance. Oh. So that was the missing point. And yes. once, wow. you know, I introduced and they said, oh, no problem. This is amazing. We can't wait for this to grow to other airports. And I said, don't worry, I'm going to make that happen too. So we launched, I did a conference uh, and for all airport guest services and volunteer program directors. And I said, this is what I'm doing. We're going to launch in 2013. If you're interested, keep my information and call me. Uh, on tax day, April 15th, 2013, we had our big event and launched it. And we've been going strong ever since. Wow. Amazing. That is so amazing. Paint a picture for us. So there are volunteers. They're at the airport. They're holding leashes of dogs. And what? Just walk around? So they, once you go through TSA, so when you're in the gated area waiting for your flight, that's where they are. They have vests. The dogs have big red vests that say pet me on them. And then the volunteers have t-shirts that say pup program, pet sun stressing passengers. So that's how you can see us. And they just roam around. And it is magic. I never, I do it with my own dogs. I never get tired of watching people's reactions. Oh my God, the way I would feel if I could pet a dog. When you're in the airport and there's not like access to fresh air or outside, you kind of forget that animals even exist because you can't see them. Like when I see a passenger who has a dog, it is so out of left field for me. It's hard for me to even get it. Seeing a dog while I was waiting for a flight, because I'm not a great flyer, would be such an extraordinary game changer. Just seeing it. Yeah. Petting it. I mean, now you're talking like... Xanax. Right. (laughs) That's amazing. So do you have it set up um, like a schedule? Like certain dogs go on a certain day to different um, uh, airlines or how does that work? That's a great question. So luckily LAX is big and we're busy literally 24 seven. So the volunteers can make their own schedule. So they can come the day and the time that works the best for them. And so I do have coverage seven days a week multiple terminals different times of the day like i have a volunteer that comes in at 10 o'clock at night oh, my oh gosh. and they're handling their personal dog mm-hmm. yes they're got their it. own personal dogs got it oh wow that is so cool oh my god chloe would love that chloe she would may come have alive. been put on this earth for that we're gonna talk about my chloe yes so all of these dogs have gone through the training program to be therapy dogs they're all so, certified you can't train a dog to want to do this. They have to want to do it. Okay. It's just in their makeup. And so that's why we have breeds, ages, you name it, all different breeds, ages, sizes. I had a deaf dog, a blind dog, a tripod dog. You know, we've got pit bulls, Rottweilers, shepherds, pugs, uh, me. chihuahuas. <laughs> Chance. Chance. Um, I am also there. <laughs> He's like, I need to stretch my leg. Yeah, that's um, cool. <laughs> We've got all ages, mixed breeds, you name it. Uh, If they want to do it and they love doing it, then we start the testing process. Got it. If they pass the testing process, then they're registered and certified. And then they have to do background checks, the volunteers, just like employees. So they need to pass that. And then I onboard them and make sure that they know what they're doing, that they feel comfortable. 
but everybody has to come through me first. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you've done pet therapy for 10 years. The airport's a completely different animal. Yeah. And so I do a walkthrough and make sure it's a good fit for both volunteer and the dog. Because like you guys said earlier, it's a people animal thing. You've got people traveling for different reasons. Of so that volunteer needs to be warm and fuzzy too. You're right. Oh, you could catch someone on a really bad day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, asking for a friend if it's in the works that you were considering therapy dogs on flights. Yes. You are? So <laughs> I had conversation with a couple airlines before COVID and that was something we wanted to do like a test run, like on a short flight to see what does that look like. Um, so I'm hoping that we're going to strike up those conversations again and do it because I think it's really important. That is so cool. That is so cool. I'm very excited by that. That will make all the difference in the world. Maybe no Xanax needed for you. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready to commit to that, but like, I would be open <laughs> to the possibility. <laughs> Chloe on your lap or Chance at your feet? No, it would be... Uh, well, I want to ask you about Chance. Yes. I, I don't know if anyone can see Chance because he's been hanging on the floor, but like, how did Chance enter your life? And did you... Are, when you're looking to add a dog to your pack, are you looking for a therapy dog? I'm looking for the personality of a dog that could be a therapy dog. Okay. Because he's 12 now. He's got plenty more years oh, to yes, go. Oh, yes, he does. Yes, yes he, he does. does. He's going to live forever. He yeah. came up those stairs like no it problem. was like yep. nothing. He's, yeah, he's he's spectacular. But um, so, yes, that's what I look for for my own personal dogs. But mm -hmm. he, this is a, um, a great story. I had, so Chowzy, my chow mix, mm -hmm. who was my first therapy dog, um, who was the one that got the ball rolling at the airport. When he passed away, my bestie, Elaine Hendricks, was like, oh, I have a new dog for you. And I was like, Elaine, not right now. It's like, you know, I had two other dogs and the cats. And I'm like, I, you know, I just, I'm not ready. And she goes, oh, no, he's the perfect dog. So literally, she pulled him from the shelter. <sighs> San Bernardino, he was going to be euthanized. Can you imagine? Don't listen. I well, know. I mean, it's. I know. And so she had him for a week because he had kennel cough and then once he was fine she's like you have to meet him and of course she's sending pictures and like he literally walked into my house and he, it was like hey i'm here and i was like you're here oh wow intervention divine intervention yeah yeah i mean and he was he just knew it was like i didn't even have to have a leash on him i'd be like you know chance come sit and he just did it it was just wild and so the only thing, this is so crazy, he was afraid of the car. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I get it. You were probably dumped. And so you think a car is a bad thing. So mm. we practiced getting into the car, you know what I mean? Sitting in the car together and getting out. And we did this for a couple of weeks because he literally would like flatten out like a pancake and pee on himself. Aww. And I was like, dude, you love everybody. Like, you've got a job. I know you're going to love it. So one day it just clicked. And now, like, he would just jump through the window to get in the car. Oh, he's like, so excited to go to work. Like, he is. He knows. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. I'm actually interested because you mentioned your dog before was a chow mix. And I love chows, but I know that there are people who have, like, certain fears around breeds. And I wonder if that plays a role in therapy dogs and therapy dogs at the airport. Do you notice, like, people are more open to some dogs than others? I feel like they have helped break the stereotype of certain breeds that people have fears of. Because yeah. we had at one time eight pit bulls. And one day for fun, they all got together and were like walking down the terminal. It was like a commercial. <laughs> and people were like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And people have said throughout the years, I would have never trusted or liked a pit bull. And I met your dog. At, I met this dog. I met this one, Callie. I met Rusty, whoever. And it changed my world. That's so, so great. Huge. I love that. Isn't, I know. I like, so it gets huge. me like, woo. Yeah. It's so powerful. Yeah. And you created that. <laughs> so I want to go back. You had mentioned that you meet all the dogs because you're looking for specific, um, I guess, personality mm -hmm. traits. What are those traits? It's just a dog who's really even keeled. Nothing phases them. You know, if we dropped something loud on the floor, Chance might look up. <laughs> he might not. Um, they just have to love people. They have to love 
tons of people petting them. They can't get afraid if somebody's wearing a baseball hat or a cowboy hat. So it's just got to be a dog that like nothing faces them and that they want to do it, that they want to seek the people out. Right. So I've met some amazing dogs. And then once we get in the terminal, they're like, it's just to their owner. uh And people try to pet them and and people are like, oh, the dog doesn't like me because he's like, yeah, no, I don't like this so much. It's a great dog. So right. maybe doing pet therapy with kids in a reading room it's is better, better or the seniors at the senior center is better. But the airport is just not the right vibe. OK, that makes sense. And I think that there's something really interesting about that that we run into a lot as a rescue because people are like, oh, I don't want to rescue a dog because I don't know their history. Like, I don't know if they'll be a good family pet or I don't know if they'll be good in this situation. And the fact that you find these therapy dogs in shelters Mm. where you don't know their history and you're just looking for these certain personality traits is such an important lesson for people. Like you're not going to get these like fresh babies who have no history at all. All of these dogs have been through something. Yep. That's, uh, I mean, I'm just looking at him. I'm like, who knows what his life was like before, but wow. Yeah. Well, well, and Chowsey, the chow mix was tied up to some guy's fence. And when I had my nonprofit, I don't know how he got my name and number. And he called and he goes, hey, there's this dog and kids are throwing rocks at him. And I'm like, where are you in Hollywood? And I went and got the dog. I had no, I mean, I was just like, grabbed the dog. He was perfect. Oh my he, gosh. It was just like, so, you know, you could just got to give him a chance, let them decompress. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. he literally sat in a corner of my house, but he did nothing. He didn't growl. He didn't try to get my cats or my other dog. He just needed to breathe. So did dogs play a therapeutic role for you? And then you said, oh, this made the significant change in my life. I'm going to bring it to other people. I feel like since I had pets my whole life, which again, were just dogs and cats off the street or that people didn't want, you know, I've never been, my family, we've never been to a pet store and just the love and like the relationship I've always had with them. I have horses. I mean, it's like a goat, you name it. (laughs) I've had it. And it was just something that was so important. And so when the opportunity came up at Animal Services, I was like, oh, my God, working with dogs and getting paid for it. How amazing is that? So it was like a no brainer. A no brainer for me. Yeah. And I can't imagine ever doing anything else. Amazing. Ever. Well, your life's path was kind of handed to you. Oh, I love that. You're like, I'm at the airport. I'm doing a job I don't want to do, but I'm ready for the new one when it comes. And then it came. I know. Right. That's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. And sometimes I still go, okay, this is real. Like dream job. Yeah, 100%. I say I have the best job in the world. And, you know, f- people at the airport, you know, friends and different divisions, you know, they're like, we love what you do because the employees appreciate it. I'm airport sure. police, TSA, the people who work in the stores, they love collecting the dog's cards. Oh. You know, it's a big deal. Like all the passengers who meet them get them. You know, the people who work there get them. And it just brings people together. That's so cool. Oh, and for our listeners, the cards are like little baseball cards that you get made for each of the dogs and it has their staff yeah. in it, right? Yeah. That's such a fun thing to collect. Yeah. Do your dogs end up with like a social media following because of that? They do. It's very cute. So we have our at LAX Pups social media, but pretty much all of the volunteers have their own their dogs have their own social well, media yeah. and it's adorable i mean i you know i'm like they're rock stars what can i say <laughs> i'm their they agent <laughs> yeah. you're like i'll take a cut of that <laughs> have you ever had the experience when you're in the airport and say a traveler is not a dog person but that person's having so much like anxiety about traveling that chance or whomever comes up to him and by the end, he's like, okay, I'm a dog lover now. That's such a great question. And so many times people who are afraid of dogs, don't particularly like dogs, have never met a dog. It's fascinating and you'll see them watch other people interact with them. And then finally they'll ask a question. Is this, is, you can, if this dog is friendly, why is this dog here? And it's a great opportunity to talk and to educate them and then you'll see their hand will start to slowly go down and it's magnetic I can't mm -hmm. help it (laughs) or like little kids who are afraid you know the parents are like you know the kid will watch and maybe the kid will you know just just do one finger and it's like good job good job you know Um, or people are just 
I love when people are on their phone talking to somebody. They're like, wait, hold on. Oh these God. dogs. Oh, my God. We can pet these dogs. Hold on a second. And they just leave their phone. I'm like, no, don't leave your phone. Or they're like, put it on FaceTime. Aww. Or, you know, or they're just smiling from afar and they're just never had an interaction, but they're enjoying watching other people enjoy. Yeah. Well, and just seeing a dog at the airport. It's really it's shocking. Yeah. I love it. I think you're right, because the way you said it, like you're in this enclosed space and dogs are kind of the unexpected and more so these days people are traveling with their dogs. But always when you see a dog, it's like when I take my dogs traveling, everybody's obsessed. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, well, when we're just walking down the street, like they're just dogs walking down the street. But yeah. here it's different. Well, yep. people crave that. It's like such pure energy. Yeah. Love that. I do too. And you see the people, you'll see somebody walking just kind of with the face that's, they're thinking about a thousand things yeah, or who I'm knows. I'm going on a business trip. And then they see a dog <laughs> and, with, and they're like, you can see them go, does that say pet me? You can see their brain going, can I really pet this dog? And then the smile. And then it's oh, like yeah. a magnet. It's oh, just, yeah. oh my God, I can pet this dog. Businessmen in their suits on the floor hugging dogs. I mean, I you know. I love that. Oh, wow. So has this become the norm in other airports in the United States? I have helped 91 airports to start similar programs here. Canada, Spain. I can't remember if it's Australia or New Zealand. They've kind of been back and forth. Are they going to start one? And then the thing that's really cool is now other airports are also helping other airports start programs. Like if they have a relationship with somebody, they may not know me and they'll help them or they send them to me. You know, I just there was a thread the other day, somebody at a small airport in the Midwest and everybody's like, talk to Heidi, talk to the godmother of therapy dog program. The godmother. The godmother. I love that. Amazing. The Griselda Blanco. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh my God, I'm watching that right now. I am too. Yeah, I was. I was like, maybe this is not podcast appropriate, but for that show. <laughs> I mean, the effect on every traveler, I just can't imagine they get to their destination and they tell the story of waiting for the flight and this dog comes and it's just such a joyous moment. That feels like a snowball effect mm -hmm. that is really impactful. I have a really cute story. There was a man traveling with his son who was on the spectrum and where they lived they were not allowed to have dogs and they were and this was i'm going to say maybe eight years ago they were traveling through and met one of uh, it was molly one of our pups and the little boy had the card and his i like ah, i get so teary-eyed sometimes with tears of joy um sent me a picture of their son and he would have dinner with molly's card every night oh, no Oh right? my gosh, changed his life. Changed his life. Just the the impact that Molly made on him. And then the trading card that that little boy, I'm sure still has. And he's oh, yeah. older, much older now. You know, I have people who have collected the cards and, you know, they lost one of the cards or, you know, one kid, like the card you could barely see it. They're like, could you send me another card? I'm like, um, yes, absolutely. Aww. I'll send you 20. <laughs> it's like, so something so How simple, special. right? That just makes a huge impact. Yes. And I also love that they're people's personal dogs because you have that relationship with your dog and you're like, I couldn't imagine life without you. You make my life so much better. And then yeah. seeing them pass that on to other people. I mean, my dog's not set up. My dog can't do it, but I know that the dogs that can, that's got to be so fulfilling for them too. They're like, I have so much love to give. Yep. Yeah. Like my Chloe, you're going to meet her. I can't wait. <laughs> I've said to Lindsay before, I don't think that I'm like fulfilling her life the way she thinks it should be. This is a dog who has so much to give and she just like explodes with people around and just like seeks love and wants to spread joy and happiness this is my this is my dog yeah and so like hearing you talk about this i we're gonna i'm going to apply to volunteer i think because i want chloe to like this is her calling 100 percent. when i pull his vest out he it's like he knows dogs are not colorblind he knows if i pull my red shirt out and i have a lot of different red shirts he knows that one and they all do it. All my volunteers will say the same thing. Sometimes they have to hide it until they get the dog in the car because they just, get to that is their job. Mm. They were put on this planet to give love to people and they thrive on it because yeah. every dog needs a job. 
it's just what's the job is it your couch potato is it your running buddy is it a search and rescue is it yeah they all have a purpose and that's amazing that you were really the conduit to help those dogs find that purpose that is so cool so cool thank I'm you so happy your program exists as well as the other programs that you've started over yeah. your career that have made a huge impact on our lives Thank you. Well, definitely, we're going to head to a meet and greet with Chloe. Yes, please. And have her see. people call your people. Yes. <laughs> I will set, set that. I am her momager. Right. So I will handle that for her. <laughs> oh, she would just love it. Yeah. Can you tell people how they can find you on your website, the internet? Yes. So you can, um, on our social media, on Instagram, at LAX Pups. You can find us on Facebook, LAX Therapy Dogs. And then if you go to the website, lawa.org slash P-U-P. Okay. And if someone has a dog who they think could be a good fit for this program. Email or call me or reach, send me a message on social media. And what I do is I have everybody fill out an application your dog has never done therapy before you're not going to be able to fill it out all the way there are going to be questions you can't answer which Mm -hmm. is no big deal Mm -hmm. i set up a time to do a meet and greet and see how you both like it if you both like it then we continue the process because sometimes dogs like i have one she's two years old she's amazing but she's still too puppy Mm. she wants to do it but she just does not and i'm like you can't She's got to grow up. Totally. You know, it's like a toddler. You can't say, stop being a toddler. Yeah. Let that, you know, we, they, we, they all develop differently at different times. She's going to be great. So we're going to see each other in six months cool. and, re, and see, can she be a little more, you know, not all over the place. Yeah. But she loves it. She loves people. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank ah. you so much for coming out and bringing Chance, who's currently snoozing on the floor. <laughs> so thank you for taking me for a nap. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just it's very cute at work. You know, I say let the dogs do what they want. If they want to lay down, if they want to be on their back, if they want to sit, stand. So he's the leaner. He'll come up and lean and then do the slide down on your feet i didn't teach him that that's how he well he knows that works he knows it works how you get a belly rub and yeah they fall asleep on the job and people think it's hysterical and you know no one thinks it's funny when i fall asleep on the job (laughs) (laughs) just as long as you wake up when you land at your gate on the other side (laughs) yeah yeah well i have every time so far good but we need to do a field trip like well you know what we can do when chloe does the meet and greet (gasps) Lindsay, you'll come too would love to thank you for the invite see how the whole process works yeah yeah so we'll have to have an update about that. Let's do that. Yeah. yeah. I'm so excited. I'm so excited for Chloe too. I'm excited for all of this. Thank you so much. And thank you for being here and sharing all of this amazing information and your dog. Well, thank you, ladies. <laughs> thank you. He, he is out. Get, I know. You're I like, know. maybe he'll lift his head if you drop something. I was like, I'm sure if I talk to him, he'll lift his head, but he's not. Chance. But anyway, let them. I appreciate what you ladies do. Thank you oh, thank for you, being bro. out there and making a difference for the animals and for doing this podcast. It's just great to educate and connect people with great things that so many people are doing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh.